All right, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. I'm going to go ahead and get started here. My name is Hunter Smith, and I'd like to welcome you to the uh, Asia Pacific Online Trader Summit. Um, most of there's probably a lot of you that have actually attended some of our online trader summits before. They're widely uh, successful, and and essentially what I wanted to do was. Um, put together some market experts from the Asia Pacific region and uh, really share with you uh, their insights and, and their methodologies uh, so that uh, you could get a little bit of a, a different perspective on, on different markets around the world. So I'm very excited you're here with us this, uh, this morning in the Asia Pacific region, uh, this evening uh, here in the States. Uh, if you guys have uh, attended a webinar with us before, you know that we we get a disclaimer uh, out of the way here, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, this demonstration is designed to instruct you on using Metastock and accompanying software plugins uh, and are not recommendations to actually buy or sell, but rather guidelines to interpreting and using these specific indicators, features within the software. The information, software, and tech techniques presented today should only be used in, by investors who are aware uh, of the risk inherent in trading. Metastock shall have no liability for any investment decisions based on the use of their software, any trading strategies, or any information provided in connection with the company. Now that we've got the legalities out of the way, a little bit more about Metastock. Some of you have been using Metastock for years and years and years, dating back to our floppy disk days, and some of you are brand new to Metastock. So a little about us, we've uh, actually been in business for about 30 years, and we've been a, a pioneer in the technical analysis software um, uh, genre for uh, the majority of that 30 years. Uh, we've actually uh, just got our 25th straight year uh, of being the Reader's Choice Award winner in Stocks and Commodities Magazine for um, best technical analysis software. Our professional, Metastock professional version is actually on 11 years uh, straight. Uh, we're very, very excited uh, about that. We have wonderful things uh, going on with Metastock right now as well as coming down the pipeline. Um, now, we don't just do online events. We actually do a lot of uh, events all over the world. Uh, one in particular, a lot of you are, are in Australia right now. Good morning to you. Uh, we're actually going to be in Sydney July 16th and 17th. We'd love for you to join us. Uh, we will be at the uh, Radisson Hotel and Suites in Sydney. Uh, we have typically the, this um, event, we bring in some of uh, you know the, the top experts in, in their fields. We're, we actually have... Rahul Mahindar coming, we have Stuart McPhee, we have Paul Nogin who will also be speaking with us today, and then uh, from Metastock we have Scott Brown and, and Kelly Clement. Now normally this is uh, $5.99 for the event, we're doing a uh, Asia Pack Summit price of $200 off uh, at $3.99. Uh, enough about us, let's get to our first presenter, uh, Mr. Gary Burton. Gary Burton is, uh, we've actually worked with him for quite a long time. Um, he has created uh, the Haguro method, which is very, very popular. It's actually had a couple of reviews and write-ups in Stocks and Commodities magazine. Um, that's actually already within Metastock. He's going to be teaching us a little bit about that today and his methodology. Uh, he's traded for, for many, many years. He's also worked as a private client uh, advisor broker in equities and options with three leading institutions in Australia. So very, very experienced um, with Metastock, with, with us, and, and obviously in the market. So I'm excited to uh, uh, bring him to you today. Uh, Gary, are you there? Can you hear me okay? All right, now you should be able to see my first screen there. We can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so today, uh, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for Metastock for inviting me along uh, to this presentation. Before I get going, uh, 
I would really like to uh, give credit to uh, Jeff Gibby at Metastock who worked with me on the Segura method uh, for several months to get it programmed in. Uh, Jeff and I met at a trade exhibition here in Sydney and uh, he saw it, uh, liked it and uh, we went ahead and programmed it in and it's, uh, I still believe it's a free, uh, free add-on. So today I'm going to uh, talk about uh, building a rule-based uh, plan and really developing out an edge in the market. And we're going to refer to this uh, Hagura method. Um, I'm going to talk about four concepts essentially, um, the weekly, the daily, um, and have a look at some pivot points and outside ranges along the way. So I have a disclaimer. Uh, the information contained in this material is intended for general advice only. It does not constitute take into account your investment objectives or financial situation or particular needs. Uh, we do recommend you contact a licensed financial advisor before acting on any information you may see or hear. So uh, Hunter's mentioned my background, there's my background there, currently president of the Australian uh, Sydney branch of the Australian uh, Analyst Association and a member of the Professional uh, Analyst Association as well. So we get up to this thing, uh, trading, we, it's quite interesting that uh, we there's a lot of education around about trading and uh, we find I find it um, quite staggering that when uh, often when I talk to traders that they've done a bit of education and then suddenly they find out well it's it's is it psychology that I need um, and no one ever really mentioned that at the beginning and I kind of disagree with that in a sense that I think it's a real understanding of your price action is what you need and rather than a casual look at uh, prices going up or prices going down, we need to get into the detail of price movements and in this example here, this could be any any sort of trade setup uh, here, whatever ticks the boxes for us at the time and we decide that we're going to enter into a, enter into a position uh, on could be uh, two, uh, two indicators giving us a buy signal and a bit of price action giving us a buy signal. So there's only two things we know at the time is what our entry price is going to be and what our stop is going to be. They're the only two pieces of information that we know. We can't know anything in the future. We don't even know what's going to happen in the next five minutes. So, so we create, but we create this kind of belief that we would of, of an outcome that we would like to see. And uh, so with trade, the trade gets opened and often it doesn't matter how long or how hard we stare at the screen, uh, the market is just the market. And there was a wonderful presentation with uh, John Bollinger yesterday and he said, he made the statement, never argue with the market. And so, uh, but we tend to bring our, uh, we tend to bring our, um, for want of a better word, baggage to the market. Uh, wanting to get an outcome that we've already decided should happen. So what really, uh, what we kind of need to develop here is a, a function that uh, inside our trading, inside a trading plan that will deal with whatever comes at us, that will deal with if the price is, is uh, giving us a profit or the price is giving us a loss. We need rules inside or develop up some guidelines and rules to give us a way to manage whatever comes to us because we don't know what's going to come to us at any point in time. But we, we can build an understanding of our price action and, an un, and on basic statistics and really quite simple statistics about uh, uh, putting a trading plan together. So in this case, all good. It's uh, been a buy and the price has, uh, price has moved on. So what's the real game here? The game, the game of, of trading, I always ask this question when I'm doing face-to-face uh, -face, uh, workshops, is what's the real game here? Is that uh, we bring our hopes and expectations to trading and often uh, a very good uh, friend of mine, uh, Ivan Crastons, asked me a very long time ago, he said, what do you want to get out of trading? And I said, well, you know, the usual, and I asked this question as well, you, well, you want to get some money out of it and you want to make a living out of it and, you want to do this, and he said to me, he said, well, what about if you created a system that you could trade that one day you don't, have, so that one day that you don't have to trade? So that is really building a business plan now around market action, building a business plan around the markets and markets of your particular interest, and they could be they could be anything. Uh, when I was working on the desk, I was quite staggered that. Um, people would uh, get an interest in options or get an interest in, in futures or, or, and they'd simply jump from flower to flower and or jump to FX uh, believing that that's the, that's the next, uh, next big thing. Whereas each 
particular area of the market can give you uh, what you're really looking for if you spend the time and do a little bit of study. So we're going to have a look at some very simple study methods uh, on that today. So like many games, it's about working out the odds and working with those odds to build a rule-based approach. The game is understanding the risk and reward of, of simple stock movement and you know the odds of what of something occurring and, and those those statistical odds will give you uh, belief in your system that you develop or belief in and ultimately belief in yourself but it belief in you know there's no no issue taking the next trade when it comes up uh, around your rules so the first part of the game is accepting the market and we have to, uh, when we don't know about the market, we, well, you know, the market's there and that's interesting. But it seems like once we get involved with it, things get a little bit more complicated. So in this example here, in this uh, process one, we have uh, a set of zeros. Can I get my little pen here? There we go. In this uh, process one here, uh, we have these uh, recurring zeros occurring. So when we get up here to the right hand side, it's pretty much a given that uh, there'll be a zero next because there's something happening to create that particular outcome. So there's no game here because we already know what it is. And process two produces a series of X's. So that's really um, a given that you'll see an X uh, at the at the next, uh, next station uh, because that process is giving us that, um, that outcome. So then it gets a little uh, more interesting where we have these patterns start to arise, x, uh, 0, x, 0, x. So it becomes uh, really almost a given that uh, we, we're going to get an x up here and we're going to get a 0 in this process as an ongoing uh, evidence-based outcome. The evidence has given us x0, 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 x0. We have enough information to say that the next one will be a 0. And then we get a little bit more complicated and the markets, uh, we, this is, we're starting to approach uh, this, uh, not so much a random outcome in the markets, but the markets themselves that are driven by uh, all different types of information, whether it's economic information or news of the day or um, simply uh, price and trader, uh, trader action. So we have this 0xx, 0xx, 0xx and so on and then it would be a pretty much a given that we're going to get an XX uh, in here. And the same in this particular pattern here, now we have an X and three zeros, X three zeros and so on. So we would really be expecting three zeros down here. All good so far. Then we get to this, where we have this random or seemingly random outcome. So zero XX, zero X, zero X, zero, and three X's and one zero and four X's and three zeros and, and there's no particular pattern in here. And the same on the bottom here, uh, there's X and four zeros, X and, and um, seven zeros, X two zeros, X and three zeros and so on. So this seems to be where we have this randomness of, of the market, but there's something very, very astute to get out of this little simple little exercise here in, and it's something that will separate you out as a trader is when you look inside this inside this whole area here, when you look inside here, we get these areas of straight zeros and areas of straight X's in here and it looks like this. This is the bit that we want. This is the one that we're looking for where we get a particular run in the market. We don't know when it's going to happen. It's true to say at the right hand edge here, we do not know what's going to happen here, but there we can build a very, very simple outlook about what will give us a high probability at the right hand edge without any guarantees. But this is what shows up. This is what randomness looks like and this is the potential outcome of randomness is where we get these movements in stock or futures or currencies um, along the way. So, and we don't know, the, the point of the exercise is we don't know when it's going to turn up here at this, at this point in the market. We don't know when it's going to turn up at the right hand edge, but we know from history it does turn up. From time to time it does turn up. Now, this is the odds. What are the odds? So you keep your, you, this is the purpose of stop losses, it's the purpose of take profits uh, in the market. Let's have a look. 
So the game is understanding the simple risk and reward of stock movement. We've made that statement. And often market uh, traders try and outthink the market and they make up broad statements like it's going to go up. They create a belief about it's going to go up or it's going to go down because they've done the work, they've done the observation, they've read all the reports, they've read the news items and they create this, this uh, belief system internally. So trades are often taken on that, on that simple uh, belief system. So those types of statements, it's going to go up, is really saying, I know what's going to happen in the next 60 minutes or the next day or the next week. And the fact of the matter is, you have no idea, I have no idea what is going to happen in the next day or the week or coming, coming uh, period of time that we're working in, whether it's even intraday charts. We don't know those things. But we seem to hang a lot of our self-worth at times on the outcome of those things. Just a quick word on money management uh, in here. The textbook, uh, textbook guidelines for position sizing and uh, this I'll talk, I'll be referring to this as we go along, but the textbook uh, area of position sizing says that if you decide that you want to risk 1% uh, of your account, $100,000 account, um, risk 1% gives you $1,000 that you're prepared to risk and you then you nominate for whatever method you use, nominate a distance to your stop loss in dollars and cents and I've used uh, just a number of 32 cents. We simply divide that 32 cents into $1,000 gives us our position size uh, in the market. So it means that if the stop loss is hit then we simply hand over 1% of our account. This type of uh, evidence-based uh, stop loss I'll, we'll have a look at uh, as we go forward. Also in Australia we have the SPY futures contract and I've just pulled this out as just as an example here, the same type of thing, that if we have $100,000 that we have in a trading account and we decide that we're going to risk half a percent in here, the, we nominate a distance to stop in this case as 10 points, uh, the SPY trades at $25 a point, therefore 10 points is $250. If we're going to risk $500 we can take two contracts and that will give us our fixed, our known part of our trading plan. That's the known part of your trading plan. The point of taking the trade becomes the unknown part of the trading plan. But we can create uh, guidelines around it to handle whatever comes to us. So building a rule-based trading plan. Just a, before we go there, the um, always in my presentations, always in my workshops, we go through this methodology of trend. Now I have a very strong view, um, my background is around Dow theory uh, and basic trend analysis uh, developed up um, you know, basically, most people know 80, 100 years ago with uh, Dow and uh, Ray and um, the people around them. But essentially what it says is that the market makes a low and makes a market moves up and makes a high and for whatever reason comes back into here, sellers come in, uh, but the buyers come in early and swing this up and we create a higher low here and as the market moves forward, the most important thing is that right at this point here, we now have a trend where the buyers are willing to take the price over a previous higher price before the, the sellers came in. And the expectation always is that the trend is in place until you have evidence that it has changed. And so this uh, makes, the market makes a high, a high out here, sellers come back in as they do and this time again they produce a higher low with uh, before it gets back to this, this level down here and so we have evidence of a higher low as the market moves higher and it pushes past this high again and, and moves on and makes a higher low again and a higher high and a higher low. So Nirvana, Nirvana in a trend. And then at times markets don't make the, don't take out that high, don't take out that previous high there's the bit where we start to sit on the edge of our seat and markets move lower, make a low in here, then uh, the buyers come back in, try and push it again above the previous high, can't get it there and the market breaks down into, into here 
should say, and at this point we have a downtrend in place. This is the definition of trend. Um, I'm sorry it's so simple, but I've seen um, uh, descriptions of trend based on moving averages and, and various other things, indicators and, and things, but this is the, the buyers and sellers are the only people in the market. The exchanges only do one thing, they, they facilitate buying and selling, that's all they do. So we're interested in what the buyers and sellers are doing along the way. So in this example, we have this continuing lower highs and lower lows, and so the trend, the downtrend is in place. As a broad uh, understanding of price movement in the markets, this uh, example here, really just a textbook um, textbook example, but we see often that markets make what we call a primary move, a very large impulsive move in price action uh, in there, and at times they settle back into these uh, what we call secondary moves. So I'll just go back to my slide here, and we can see when we look inside this price action, there are some very, very strong uh, primary moves, and they're in the direction of the trend and you get these very strong, uh, very strong movements uh, of price that are really quite confirming uh, down the bottom here as well, really quite confirming of the trend. And then on the other side as markets roll over we get these very strong downward movements. But in between we have these little areas of what we call secondary markets, these little uh, bar by bar creates a lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, on the way down, so it's um, the you can see that the ranges within these secondary markets basically trade over each other. The, the trading periods, whether it's daily, weekly, intraday, basically trade over each other, and it becomes the, the description becomes a secondary market. So that's this area area down through here. And then if trends uh, and markets are in place, then we get this impulsive impulsive move out of there, and the trend resumes. So not a precise outcome, it depends on many uh, factors, both fundamental and technicals, company reporting, that type of thing, um, news of the day, uh, but essentially that's the methodology uh, around the, uh, there's a little bit more to it, but around Dow theory and simple observation of price action. The methodology that uh, Jeff Gibby and I worked on came out of, I must give credit to this, uh, came out of a book called The Japanese Chart of Charts by Siki Shimizu and it's a little known book, it's still available um, in uh, around the place, but inside contained in here is uh, it's really a book about futures trading um, in a sense, but it has this what they call a weekly method, Haguro method. Uh, in there, so we took it out and we program. I wrote papers on this about ten years ago. I've used it every day since, and uh, we have now put it inside uh, Metastock, and I'll come to that in a moment. So, essentially, the Haguro method works around a weekly chart, uh, the, the bigger time frame charts, which is where, which is where really institutions and larger players really work is uh, out in larger time frames, take longer term views of the world. So in deciding the classification of each line, now the line is the is the low of the week and the high of the week and uh, at this stage that's the first part of first part of a candle, it's the first part of the bar that we really want to observe is the absolute range of the week and the highs and the lows. So the classification of each line will look at the opening and closing price compared to the line itself. The most important part of the Haguro method is the middle of the range of the week. We don't know what that middle of the range is until we get to Friday. So it's a weekly method, Friday afternoon gives us pretty much the range of the week and the middle part of that range. And there's a phenomena uh, around this, built around this middle price, we'll take a look. So we notice then that um, candles form uh, Clearly, in all different in, in all different forms, depending on the week. So, in this example here, the all we're doing here is stating that the uh, open and close of the week, uh, the Monday open, Friday close, is uh, ended up really below the range of the week. So, during the weeks, at some point, the market rallied up uh, in there, and the sellers came back in and pushed it down below the middle of the uh, what turned out to be the middle of the range for the week. And the same in here as the market opened here, it had a, at some point during the week had a movement up and uh, came down 
turned around and they closed it off here on the Friday. So we just noticed that the, in this particular example that the body is above the middle of the range for the week. So there's eight classifications of green lines. These are the only eight types of line that you can have in a weekly chart. Now, for one of um, I, uh, for, for one of giving uh, esoteric uh, descriptions, uh, we could only come up with numbers uh, on there. So we've just simply given them a number. So this uh, body here is below the middle of the range of the week uh, in here, so it becomes what we call a number one. Uh, number two, we can see that the body has covered most of the range of the week with a shadow at the bottom and shadow at the top. And number three has the body in the height range of the week. And number four, uh, most important concept of number four, it has a lower shadow and has a bozu top, shaven top on the candle or, or candle range of the week. So it's closed on its absolute high on Friday. Number five, it opened uh, and did not trade lower, so a shaven base and a small shadow. Number six has a, sh a shaven base again, a bozu base, and then uh, traded up during the week and the sellers came back in and closed it down. So it's very similar to number one, but there is no shadow in the lower area. And of course, number seven is very similar to number three. Uh, there is a no shadow in the top area, just a shaven base. And of course, then the um, full uh, open on the Monday never looks back and closes on the high on Friday. Uh, interestingly enough, this type of range is considered to be very weak in a, in a uh, in stock price analysis, this full range, um, very strong uh, Marabozu candle is considered to be weak because within the week, uh, considered to be weak, W-E-A-K, uh, because within the week, W-W-E-K, it can contain an opening gap, a continuation gap and an exhaustion gap um, during the week. So it's not considered a particularly strong uh, candle. And then on the way down, as sellers come in, we have the same again, and the numbers here, they look a little random, but they, it actually does make sense when you, when you get into it. Uh, but it gives the body above the middle of the range and so on, and again, the number 16 is the body over the middle of the range, the middle of the range being here, body over the middle of the range, and uh, gives us an outcome there. And 13, shaven base here, number 12, shaven top, number 10, shave and top, and number 14, and so on. And again, the large range uh, where the shave and uh, top, shave and base, full Marabosa candle, uh, is considered quite a weak candle. Uh, it's not uh, considered to be a strong uh, looking for continuation after that. So rule-based systems are built around, built around proven observations, the entry techniques require statistics and position size and of course the percentage of risk of the account that we've, di we've discussed. So this is what really separates out retail traders from professional traders and it's sometimes the most overlooked uh, area of trading approach. People get a bit of software, open up an account and put some money in and, and really take, a, take a, a swing at the market and without any real disciplined approach uh, to their to their outcome to say that well this is why this is a structured reason and the proof is is in my statistics about why this position was opened inside uh, metastock we've de developed up the Haguro method here where on a weekly basis uh, it um, numbers each candle automatically. So it identifies the candle and numbers them uh, as each week. This is the S&P 500. Numbers them each week uh, here and um, really the, um, as the week closes, the number is, is finalized, but it's, it really contains auto numbering. And when you uh, click on the number, when you put your mouse on the number, uh, here we've got number 16 here. And in the expert advisor, we'll give you the description of that um, of that the potential outcome of that candle, and uh, says that when it's a long line, the midpoint is set as a future resistance of any declining prices. So, it's the uh, concept of the weekly range, as we mentioned earlier, is really the middle of the range of the week is quite important. So we notice that uh, the middle area. And over here on the left, we can see that about the middle of this range of the week 
really became the resistance area for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight weeks before the market really broke higher out here. But all the candle numbers are numbered. We'll get uh, Metastock out in just a moment and have a look. But all the candle numbers are numbered in here automatically. It's inside um, Metastock and it's called the Haguro method. So we wanted to then uh, expand a little further and say, well, when do they become, what do we identify as um, a low price area and a high price area? Because the Haguro method really works around identifying when markets are a little bit extended or a little bit um, uh, what's considered a low price area. So it put a very, very simple uh, range uh, filter in here. Jeff did a wonderful job with this. Uh, and essentially, the two lines here are plus or minus 7%. I should have put that in there. Uh, so I'll put that up there, 7%. And they're essentially plus or minus 7%. And we notice that uh, as the markets uh, swing around, uh, all it does is simply track from the last major high to the to the low what that swing is. And we can see up through here, this area here, down into here made a really 7%, 14% uh, swing uh, down through there. So we put this in here just as uh, John Bollinger explained so well, just to give it some relative um, space, some relative um, against the background. It is relatively low here and it is relatively high here. So we then start to notice that the candle numbers, uh, the particular candle numbers and their connotations become quite relevant when the market gets into these, in and out of these, these areas. And we can see recently uh, the S&P here uh, really got out into this over this 7% area just here. Currently it's come back in, but really back here with this candle number one in here uh, at the high of the market at recently. This is a weekly chart at the high of the market and it was a bit out there. So we start to take a little bit of notice of what's really going on uh, with that. And I'll just bring in, uh, just bring in Metastock here from my other screen. And we can see here that the the S and P uh, this number one out here now it's ended up here with a 15. But if I put it on number one here on the expert advisor, it tells us that after one week's movement, the body is below the midpoint. Well, that's the description of the candle. That's great. Uh, with a downtrend, a low price area shows short covering. Um, the following price lines, even if a rise in price takes place, will be limited and a lower price will be set. So it's given us a little bit of context about what might come in the next in the next week. Now, at the top of this presentation, I said we don't know what's going to come. That statement still stands true, but there is a proven observation around the particular candle shapes and their particular outcome and we'll go into there now. So with an uptrend, uh, it's a rejection of higher prices. It says that if the price declines from this week, look for a rising price within a few days as a great opportunity to go long. Well, we didn't see, uh, we saw a little bit of a rise in the following week and really nothing, uh, nothing spectacular happened. It didn't take out the high. Now, I'm a very great believer in, in particular uh, as a strategy that uh, prices must take out a a previous high of something of a of a candle that's that's quite relevant in here. Now, when we look through the charts, we notice that number sixteen turns up a lot of times, and number two turns up a lot of times. They're basically continuation candles along the way. We'll just get number sixteen up here. We had a look at that before. Part of the uh, expert advisor shows us that the uh, at this particular time here. Uh, and here as well, we can see that the um, percentage range here is really sort of around the middle here, around this kind of zero area here. So it tells us the range of the stock is not extended more than 7%. This means the candle lines are less significant. Okay, that's fine. So candle number 16, when this is a long line, the midpoint is set as future resistance for any price movements. And we saw back here that the middle of this range really was the resistance of that uh, week, two weeks ago, and the resistance of a uh, week before this, uh, in the middle of this range, was about here, and we've closed below that uh, middle of that range. So it's not looking particularly bullish at this point in time. 
So a position would be open short if the following week fails to move above the midpoint and closes below the low price. Well, we haven't had that either. What that states is that we, if the market moves above the midpoint, sorry, opens above the midpoint and closes below the low of that particular candle, then we would start to really look at short positions. But the S&P, the S&P is essentially in a in a primary uptrend in here with a bit of consolidation going on at the moment. And this week we had uh, finished uh, this morning, uh, for us, finished this morning a number 15 candle. So we bring that up in here, a number 15 is a reversal line when found in a high price area or a low price area. So it gives us two, two outcomes, a high price area and a low price area. Well, this could be considered a high price area considering, considering the S&P's run from the lows down here around 1800 um, out to 2100 uh, at the highs. When found in a high price area, close long positions when the following week trades and closes below line 15 um, low price, take short positions. When line 15 is found in a low price area and the following line is green, this is indicating strong buying pressure so the shorts are wrong and you should be, you should be out of there. Essentially that's what it's saying. Now it's not financial advice but it is something to be proven. Let's take a look. So this is within the uh, within Metastock itself, and we notice here I've got a chart marked up. It's a weekly chart. We can see down here. Uh, you must have your chart set to weekly uh, weekly chart. Open up weekly charts, and there's a statement here that uh, number tw uh, line number twelve. Now number twelve has the shaven uh, top and a small shadow at the bottom. So it's opened on the Monday, never traded higher and simply fallen away. Number 12, uh, open uh, an opening bozu. Also, this is a red line. When found in a low price area, is a strong probability of a green line appearing. When found in a high price area, if the following week fails to trade above the midpoint, closes below the low uh, price line, this indicates a break in the price. So it gives us two potential outcomes. But I just want to deal with the first one first. The line 12, although this is a red line, when found in a low price area, is a strong probability of a green line appearing. Is that true or not? In this example here, we can see uh, here, that I'll work from the right hand side back, down here we had a following week, it traded high. Now everyone would be short at this, uh, at this particular point. And the following week traded higher and then fell down below the low again and closed lower into a 16 candle, which is a continuation candle. Again here, second one back, the following week traded higher, shook out the shorts, but eventually they came back in and closed the market down. Number 12 here, again traded higher. Number 12 here, was followed by number five, the week traded higher. Number 12 down here, traded higher for a little bit and then uh, traded down and pretty much closed up, up through there. And when you work through your statistics of this, and this, what I did was I looked back over 300 bars, 300 weekly bars of the um, S&P uh, essentially and started to count out the candle numbers. And we found uh, that in 300 bars, Candle number 12 turned up 14 times. 10 of those times there was a green bar afterwards. So the week has closed pretty much on its low on the Friday and 10 out of uh, 14 times the next week has turned into, a, into a, an up week in there. So it gives context now to if a candle 12 turned up, well, you know, you really want to have a bit more confirmation before you get, uh, before you hold that short or get too short uh, the market. So if you're on a short position on, and the week turns into a 12, it might be a good time to close out on the Friday. We also notice that uh, did the week actually trade higher the following week at some point and 14 out of 14 times it did. So some of the other statistics that came out were at candle number four uh, in 300 bars, which is quite rare that candle number four turns up, uh, which is a very bullish candle, um, turned up seven times. Within the next week it was still higher, the second week after that it was still higher two times and the third week after that it was still higher two times in there. But it's turned up seven times. Candle number five 
here, which is also a very bullish candle, turned up 17 times in 300 bars, a little, little more regular, and 10 of those 17 the following week was positive and the second week after that was positive eight of those times and the third week was positive seven of those times. So it sort of kind of washes away this idea of buy and hold uh, in there from a trading perspective. And candle number seven, which is incredibly rare uh, and also a, it shows a top or a bottom in the markets, uh, turned up once and each time uh, it played through and worked. So we can build up an observation now of the market based on these very, very simple um, candle numbers to give us some context about where we really should be uh, based on some statistics. And I'll just, um, I'll give you a, a, another example here, I think I can, I might come back to that. So rule-based systems are built on proven observations. The entry, uh, the entry technique and the statistics behind it, the simple statistics about does this, a lot of statements are made in the Guru method, does it actually work or not, yes or no. And so it's now your kind of business to find out whether that actually does and prove to yourself and it will give you then confidence to say, well, I know what to do now uh, going forward. <clears throat> so it comes down to if this, then what? in building a trading plan around these methodologies. In here, we, this, uh, another example here, we'll take a look at uh, number three and number 15. Number three, this is a, uh, one that I watch for uh, constantly, is it's a strong warning of reversal when found in a high price area. Is that true or not? Well, we go through and we find out there's a number three uh, in here, in a high price area and it basically bought, this is uh, Wells Fargo, and essentially bought the market down. And you'll notice that, that there was no close above the high of that week going forward. So number three, when found in a high price area, long position should be closed within a week, so it gives you a bit of time to work it out. If the opening price of the following week is above the midpoint, selling is still indicated short position should be held. That's a big statement. So we, you can go through your, um, charts and prove whether that statement is true or not and you can build a trading strategy around that. The other component about three is it states here that a strong warning of reversal when found in a high price area. Number three turns up as a basically as an umbrella often in low price areas in here and we can see here and here and uh, that's I've got a bit of a snapshot of the chart. We'll get some charts out again in a moment. Let's take a look at a simple trading concept around pivot points. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of textbook um, information around pivot points. What I would like you to look at and really consider around pivot points in all time frames, whether it's intraday, daily, weekly, monthly, whatever, um, is that a pivot point is not, is really confirmed, it's not really a pivot point, but it is really confirmed when the closing price is closing over the high of the bar that makes the low down here. So often you get these very clean little textbook examples I've got here where the uh, market has come down here, uh, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, interesting candle number three at the bottom potentially if it was a weekly chart. And then uh, the high, we saw the following trading period move up and close over this high. So a pivot point, a, a, a confirmed pivot point is in place. And the same here as markets move up and the bar that makes the high, we can see higher lows in here, higher highs, and the market makes the high out through here. And the following bar at this point closes below the low. So we have a confirmed uh, down pivot point in place right there. beauty of this is that you, the, the reasoning behind this is that often uh, when you look through your charts clearly, there's this, it's not never a textbook, never, it's never a textbook outcome. But we find if you do the, if you do the statistics behind it, you'll find that when you wait for it to actually close above the high that, of the bar that makes the low in here, you have a much higher probability outcome of a potential move up in this direction. 
In this example here, we have the market moving up here on the left hand side and makes a high out through here, closes, we have a closing price here below the low of the bar, confirmed pivot in place, market moves down for one bar into here, then produces an inside period right here and the next bar here really kind of doesn't close above the, the high of the bar that makes the low, neither does the next one, neither does the next one and the market falls away. So we really had no confirmation uh, that the market was, uh, was really heading higher out here and this will, I can kind of suggest to you this may save you a lot of grief when you're looking for turning points in the market rather than guessing uh, what's going to happen, you wait for wait for confirmed statistical evidence to say that this is this is really the occasion. So we saw here this this was the bar that made the high the uh, and here the following bar closed below the low right here and the market has clearly moved lower. So a little bit of science around them and I would encourage you to do the research on that. Uh, number three uh, we're looking at number three again, this is Wells Fargo again, number three at the high and the low and we notice here that number three, the number three candles often in many stocks and indices, the number three when it shows up on a weekly basis indicates the low. You know what your risk is, a position taken on the close above that number of the high of number three, your risk is the range of that bar, becomes your risk. So consider that when you're setting up your position size is that the risk is the range of the, pre, of the, of the bar of observation along the way. <clears throat> so we find uh, in uh, using this Segura method, uh, once the candles uh, are numbered and it really brings out a bit of detail in the chart, we often find um, that uh, threes uh, in here will show up in low areas and in high areas of price action and along the way. So here again, this is the S&P, uh, in here shows a number three in the high area, number three in the low area and the real trade occurred when we bring it across here, that's where the trade occurred, right there. One, two, three, four, five weeks later it confirmed. Number seven candle here, an extremely bullish uh, candle with a shaven top, testing the lows again, a shaven top in here and the notes, they rarely show up but the notes suggest that this is a strong uh, buying line as is a, num as is a number five. So again, uh, number three candle down in here, uh, market uh, did close over here and simply a, uh, it didn't get down to the didn't get down here, so a stop may have been taken uh, at this point uh, in there. And then a number five candle, we'll bring this out again, but and number nine as well, number five candle turned up and this is the key, this is the key for trading outcomes is the um, money management side of the market. You take your stops when they turn up and then you take your entries based on your statistical evidence that there is a trade in play and those movements in the market, those series of zeros or series of X's will simply cover when you often you have to take stops along the way. As an aside, we ran a, a portfolio here at FP last year for 11 months uh, based on $100,000, it took 47 losses huh. um, and 17 wins and it ended up 34% just trading equities. It's not the win-loss ratio per se, it's the outcome of the, it's the movement of the wins and taking your losses very, very quickly along the way. So again, um, Wells Fargo, just to point out, uh, that the number 15 candle, we'll get some charts out in just a minute, number 15 candle here rarely or never shows up at the lows. Uh, number 15, uh, a reversal line when found in a high price area, you'll see them show up in high price areas as a reversal line up in here as reversal lines and currently uh, a couple of weeks ago another one turned up here you see the market moved from the three low here into the three high 
um, shows and the, and the notes against the number three are that if it turns up in a high price area and so on, it becomes a uh, uh, one to watch as a key reversal in there. So an outcome can be built out of simply observing the, the candle numbers. Now you notice the also notice the black dots on here. The uh, part of this um, Haguro method, as I mentioned earlier, is the middle of the range of the week. So what Jeff and I did is we really singled out the large ranges of price movement. The ones that really stand out um, as large ranges, this number two here, is a very large range compared to the previous ranges in the background. So it sets up the midpoint support in there. We can see that one, two, three, four, five, six weeks basically remained above that closed above that midpoint support and once that support is broken then it's considered that the back of the candle is broken. So currently in Wells Fargo we have this uh, area here and we have this really strong resistance area through there based on this one candle that occurred basically back in January this year is yet to be resolved in the, on the upside. So it might be a little worthwhile to sort of wait until that uh, price range around 5150 or so uh, is resolved and put probability on your side uh, with a strong buying candle turning up at some point and put probability on your side that there is a potential upside in here. The other concept uh, that I would, uh, the fourth one uh, concept I'd like to look at is this, uh, just make mention of really is um, the outside range. Now outside of candle numbers and uh, that type of thing, the outside range here, very, very important um, trading period that turns up very often at, um, at turning points uh, in, in uh, markets. So an outside range simply has a lower low and a higher high than the previous range. So this one here. So this following candle has a lower low and a higher high than that one, as does this guy down here has a lower low and a higher high than the previous candle. Now there's a little bit of um, uh, observation to be made about whether it's an up close or a down close, but uh, for the sake of the exercise now, we'll just take this um, observation that they turn up from time to time and they often mark the highs and the lows uh, in the market. This is uh, Apple uh, in here recently. We've seen um, uh, last year, uh, essentially during 2015, Apple uh, turned up a, a number 15 here, uh, which really set the um, resistance up, or really set the the lost the market lost its bullishness through here, and then this uh, rather large out number 16 here turned up, but it's also an outside range, which indicated the top of the market in Apple, and if you didn't believe that one, then another one turned up here. Also, uh, during the following weeks, during May, June last year, nothing traded above that 16 high, and again here, nothing traded above, and this one being a large range really set up that resistance uh, in there. So the result is that um, in the uh, ultimate high back here in May, the midpoint resistance was closed over here at uh, one stage and immediately rejected, didn't close out past the high and was immediately rejected into these lows. So essentially, you can build observations around um, really simple candle analysis, outside periods, inside periods, that type of thing. Now I think I can, um, I think I can show you a document here. This is, um, uh, essentially a work in progress. Now this is around, um, let me come up here, what I've done is just simply built a very simple uh, spreadsheet um, on an observation that I've made in the gold market. And it gives me, and I'm building statistics on this, a lot of interest around gold at the moment. We'll take a look at the gold chart in just a moment. Um, trade direction, entry, stop, exit, profit loss, and my R return, my risk reward return of a particular uh, trade. So what I've essentially done is built up these statistics over many, many months uh, in gold down through here until we get to these equity curves. Now I can, you can see that the P&L goes to zero here. I've got a zero, I've got a zero wrong in my 
in my chart somewhere. I just thought I'd pull this out this morning. But we can see that the R value, the risk return value, really does motor along uh, on this particular outcome. And the ultimate uh, P and L in points, um, there is a there is a steady grind higher. So the methodology produced 32 wins, 17 losses. And I'll go down a bit further here. And my little system is written out when the contract open. This is a Sydney time. When the contract open and closes, um, the Asian open, the European open, the US opens, that type of thing. And it's simply based on an inside period, sell the bottom, buy at the top, in there, and produces these types of these types of curves. It's a it's proving itself out. A little bit of work to do yet, but it's proving itself out. So rule-based systems are built on proven observations. The entry technique and the statistics, they're the only two things that really apply here because the statistics will give you a potential outcome after the entry technique. And this is really what separates retail from professional, as I stated earlier. The most overlooked area of a trading approach is uh, what I find tragically is, is uh, people won't do the work. They won't actually do the work, and one of uh, one of the funniest things I ever heard, someone uh, in I go to plenty of presentations as well, and someone said in a presentation they said we should be able to ring you up at two o'clock in the morning and wake you up from your sleep, and you should be able to tell me your trading uh, your trading plan. It's verbatim uh, out of your out of the out of that slumber uh, woken slumber. It should be that ingrained with you that you know what your trading plan is. In there, so the trading plan is if this proven statistics, then what, then that, which is your entry or exit out of a market. The other concept um, here, this is, um, and I'll go to some charts in just a minute. But this is Apple. Um, uh, Apple uh, just recently, uh, just this week. Uh, sorry, at the uh, yeah, just this week up in here and. Uh, we can see uh, as the markets were starting to fall uh, away, there was this there was this um, very large uh, down period in here, produced a pivot point in here, and backed up by a number one candle, uh, which says the following price lines, even if a rise takes place, will be limited, and lower price will be set. Small fluctuations will occur, and so on. So we're looking at the daily chart. We're looking at simple pivot point observations in daily charts against. Um, uh, what what the candle numbers are telling us in the weekly charts, and I'll finish up with just a very quick look at um, a very quick look at uh, some charts here. So currently, uh, currently in gold, we're seeing that uh, we saw gold trade out to thirteen hundred dollars the other day. Uh, last week and this week, gold has set two number nine candles in the Hagura numbering. A number nine appears. The trader should wait for direction. The body is above the midpoint. When the closing price lower than the open is, if this is a short line, the trader should wait for the market to show directions. The following price movements can engulf this short movement, and we often find that that you'll see in the background the number nine here. The following week really traded over that. Uh, over that week again uh, in here. There's your uh, three at the top and 15s here at the top as well. Now they were overcome. Uh, there was no close below the 15s in those two weeks and simply overcome with a very bullish candle. And now we have this little consolidation. The important observation here is that the last two weeks were above the middle of this range uh, in here. The middle of this range uh, of that number two, very strong candle compared to the previous weeks, but it is above there. So this would be on any any held positions, still held positions. This would have to be the the uh, potential area where you would sit on the edge of your seat and say, "Wait a minute, something's wrong," because this occurs this occurs on a regular basis when you look at midpoints of very strong ranges on the Hagura method, they often become areas of support and resistance going forward until they are not areas of support and resistance. Okay, the gold chart. There's also, um, I mentioned um, Apple. Uh, here I'll just uh, bring that out. Um, in here, I mentioned earlier Apple with the outside period at the top. Again, here number 16 uh, candle. If we just click on number 16, uh, long line, and um, in, in fact a long line, but and and also an outside period. 
uh, the line appears on a regular basis, indication of a high point in prices. So you've got two pieces of information. 16 often appears at the top and we see it here as rejection when the sellers come in and when the next week closes below the low you generally get con continuation with that move until, uh, until it stopped out. We can see in this example here, 16 up here, closed below the low, the following week traded lower and then was followed by a 1 and if we put on number 1 here, after one week's movement, the body is below the midpoint, indicating buying a lower price. And the following price, even if a rise in price takes place, will be limited and a lower price will be set. And we saw limited movement up here on the 15 and lower prices set down through here. So it gives you a picture along the way. So I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there and Give my thanks and uh, thank you, Hunter, and thank you, Metastock. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, and, uh, you know, what a great presentation about, uh, you know, one thing that, that we're very excited about here with the um, the Haguro method is it's very, very easy to use. It's, it's, uh, it's very simple, and since it is a uh, rules-based system, it is very, very um easy to to follow so um, moving uh, right along here uh, once again some of you are brand new to Metastock some of you have been using Metastock for a very very long time for those that are, are new to Metastock um, we are on our 25th straight year of winning the number one technical analysis software uh, the uh, the Reader's Choice Award with uh, Stocks and Commodities Magazine. Uh, if you have not tried Metastock, we are doing a special uh, three-month uh, trial uh, for all Summit users. You can access that at uh, metastock.com forward slash APAC dash summit three for one. Um, also, again, we will be making it out to Sydney, Australia. Uh, for those of you in Australia that would like to uh, meet us in person, it's going to be a, a, a wonderful event. We are holding with uh, Rahul Mahendar, Stuart McPhee, uh, Paul Nogen, who will actually be speaking here in just a moment, uh, Scott Brown, and Kelly Clement. Uh, normally, the uh, seminar price is $5.99, but we're actually going to do a Asia Pacific Summit uh, special for $200 off, so $3.99 to attend this. Um, we're, we'll be very excited to, to meet you in person, and, and uh, it's going to be actually very, very fun. Uh, 